Welcome to Viewpoints. I'm Heather Isbron, and with me today is Monica Manzella, Assistant Attorney for New Orleans, and Captain Greg Favor from St. Louis Fire Department. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us, Heather. You two are an unlikely pair, and in your course, you teamed up for a paper, and I'd like you to discuss your backgrounds and then how you collaborated on this paper. I can take it from the first initial stages. I think that we had... Um, with being together in class and sitting next to each other, we wanted to work together. We found that we got along very well and wanted to do some sort of topic together. And as drones are so popular now in terms of their implementation and the possible obstacles that could happen with their implementation, um, and me with my legal background and Greg with his operational background, we thought it would be a great paper where we have converging view viewpoints come together um, in one document that a reader could, could view and see opposing sides in one document. So I took the privacy and Fourth Amendment concerns of drone implementation, um, and Greg took the operational side of that. At least from our perspective, both, both uh, as, a, as a practitioner in the fire service and, and being from St. Louis, uh, we are the second oldest fire department in the country, and we like to think that we do our, <coughs> our jobs very well. We're always looking to improve. This is certainly a technology that is um, on the forefront, it sits on the horizon, it's going to become more ubiquitous, and there are applications for public safety that uh, we, we really need to dive into and discuss. I understand the operational benefits. I don't know that I could take uh, and make a case to my city administrators or uh, my, my city governing bodies about why we should be allowed to do this within a, a, a set structured framework. So uh, operationally, it was, it was great for us to be able to, to drive out the, the end result of a model policy that um, not only I could take to, to St. Louis, that she could take to New Orleans, but uh, that anybody could take to any um, state, city, uh, legislature and say, hey, we think these are the pillars of what we're going to need if we're going to use this to do traffic enforcement or to uh, use at hazmat scenes. So we wanted something that was, uh, it was broad enough that it could be scaled to, mm -hmm. to any sort of level that, that would be applicable for your specific needs. And quite honestly, I mean, I wasn't on board with Greg's perspective from the beginning. So the statement that he just made in terms of making the argument to your city council, your legislature, he almost had to make that argument to me because I didn't understand the operational benefits with my, with my coming at it simply from a legal perspective. I was focused on how do we make it okay when we're thinking about the Fourth Amendment, when we're thinking about possible litigation down the road, when we think about the cases that have come out talking about surveillance or man surveillance. And so it's almost that he had to make that argument to me and make me understand where he was coming from in order for this paper to even happen. Right. And so it's going to only get more complicated. And a lot of agencies and cities are probably just shying away from it. So that's what makes this paper so interesting is it is actually a template for cities, municipalities to use in order to uh, get past some of these fears. Right. And so I'd like you to talk about exactly what a city administrator or perhaps some of those legal issues that kind of get sticky are. Sure, sure. Well, at least with the research that we did or that uh, we both did for this paper, it turns out that some of the states do have laws on the books that allow the use of this technology for their safety operations. There are specific exceptions for law enforcement uses of unmanned surveillance when even those states that have specific laws prohibiting the use of unmanned surveillance, there are exceptions for law enforcement agencies. What we found, though, is there is a lack of a cohesive federal standard. Not First of all, not all states have those laws, and the states that do have those laws, they're not largely in agreement. Some have more stringent requirements than others. Some states have so many exceptions that it basically makes um, the, the use of them uh, widespread, and they can use them for whatever uh, use they want. What we are arguing for in the paper is a cohesive federal standard because of the, that lack of cohesiveness. The laws that have come out, or excuse me, the cases that have spoken on surveillance are equally sort of confusing because you have um, 2012 dissenting, dissenting opinions from the United States Supreme Court talking about the reasonable expectation of privacy and what does that mean, especially in the space of unmanned surveillance systems. And how does that change with the technology 
moving as fast as it is? And does the reasonable expectation inevitably drop to a point where unmanned surveillance becomes so widespread that you no longer can make the argument that I have an expectation for privacy because I'm taking advantage of other technologies and I'm putting my information and my likeness and my image on different sites and through different um, companies and things of that nature. So it's really interesting in terms of how the legislature and the courts are going to take all of that information and make it make one consistent message to agencies that will allow them to use this technology for their benefit while at the same time avoiding the, the complaints, the litigation that could occur uh, without a sound policy. And that's, I think, why we came up with the policy that we did, um, is we attempted to take all the state's laws and make them agree as much as we could. We also took the presidential directives and certain things that were coming out of the federal government, not laws or rules, but more directives, and tried to mesh them all together in one policy. Wow. That was but, quite a thing just for a <laughs> class paper to, to accomplish. Well, Greg did take the lion's share of, of the policy mm -hmm. um, confection from the beginning. Um, I foc my focus was on the explanation of sort of where we've come legally and where we see it going. And then Greg really made the argument for the operational use. And I'm sorry I'm taking more time oh, <laughs> to no. explain. Oh, yeah. But um, he did more of the policy work. Um, using his operational knowledge and knowing what he had to go through or we'd, he would have to go through to put it into practice. And talk about that. What are the operational uh, problems and wicked issues you have to deal with? Certainly. So the, the, the first ones that I think everybody's dealing with is the initial cost. The technology is coming down, but we're talking, this is not a hobbyist drone. We're talking about um, putting very specific delicate cameras like FLIR technology, or we're talking about putting sensor um, devices on these to, to put over hazmat situations. So the, the, the drone itself that you can buy off the shelf is certainly coming down in price, but you're adding a lot of elements to it. So there's an initial cost that people want to be able to see what is the benefit behind this. If I spend $40,000 to get a drone that I can fly for an hour and then have to recharge, what can I do in that hour? So the, the first part of the paper looks at what are the things that you could do with this once you put it in the air from a law enforcement perspective, from a search and rescue perspective, a general public safety, um, watching crowd migrations at large events like a Mardi Gras or a St. Patrick's Day parade or a 4th of July event. The, the, the paper first kind of lines out what specifically you can hope to accomplish with this. Um, and then uh, some of the other issues that people are dealing with is, is what this actually looks like in practice. So how do you sell this to a public? How do you sell um, and, and to do that, we looked at public policy polling on, on drone issues, and it's fantastic. I mean, it's fantastically interesting that if the fire department says we would love to put drones in the air to facilitate search and rescue when a four-year-old boy has wandered off into the woods, we'd love to put the, the drone up, uh, we'll fly it over a grid, we'll turn, on the, the, um, we'll turn on the FLIR technology, we'll be able to find the heat sensor, we'll bring them back. Everybody's like, yes, I love that, that's fantastic. You say, and when it's not looking for lost four-year-old boys, the police department is going to fly it, and they are going to do um, parking enforcement with the drones. They're going to take away the meter maid, and we're going to do parking enforcement. You go from about 82% approval um, to low to mid-teen approval of, yeah. of people billing, being willing uh, to just give public safety a blanket approval for, for their uses. So how you message this and how you sell it. And, and we address that a little bit in the policy about what, what agencies and legislatures need to do to let people know that uh, their privacy is, is to the best level that we can. The, the technology is coming. It's a snowball. I mean, you're not, this is, this is an avalanche. This is not going to stop no matter how the technology is, is too useful and it's getting too inexpensive. It's, it's going to happen. So you have to craft a really good public strategy around how you roll this out, around what it means, what the checks and balances are. Uh, and then I think the other, the, the backside of this is what is the, uh, what is the cumulative cost on this? Mm. This is a major issue for law enforcement uh, in terms, I mean, we see it with body cameras right now. You have your initial body camera cost, and then how do you store that? Mm. And then, you know, what's your server space look like? And now you have a freedom of information request. Do you dedicate an officer whose job it is to, you know, for eight hours a day, all he does or she does is pull specific instances off of body cameras, transfer them to a DVD, send it to you know whoever made the Freedom of Information request. There's a lot of, of back-end pieces here that are not figured out by, by many agencies, um, regardless of their size. So 
Operationally, these things are great. We know from, from the implementation that we've seen out there, they're fantastic. They're going to continue to save lives. It is getting our hands around what the, what the privacy issues look like, what the data storage issues look like, what the legality when somebody challenges, um, you know, I'm out looking for a lost boy uh, with my drone in the air and I come across a, 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 a marijuana grow field uh, on somebody's private property. Right now, um, there's precedent out there. I mean, you can you can you know reasonably start to to figure out where you would go from there. But these are issues that uh, I think when you lump them all together are so enormous uh, in scope and theory for organizations to to really kind of wrestle with when they're trying to make um, the next quarter happen on right. the budget. Right. That that we're just kind of pushing them off and saying we'll deal with that. We'll deal with that. The technology is running ahead of government right now, and we need to catch up because it's going to be very difficult to pull it back in, and it's going to be very difficult to make impassioned arguments about why this is going to make people safer um, when, when the technology has run loose for too long. I think the public has a lot to say about that and would be um, very welcoming of a mitigation and, and a constant community um, messaging. So you talked about a little bit about how you mitigated some of those concerns of the public and some of the contentiousness uh, around the ethics. Uh, tell me what you talked about in that paper. I think that what is missing is the public is not aware of all of the benefits that the drones could provide. Um, I certainly wasn't aware as a citizen. Um, it wasn't until working with Greg on this paper that I was really exposed to the myriad of benefits that it could take, not only from a search and rescue uh, perspective, but also in the event of a natural disaster. Uh, instead of sending manned aircraft out to see how extensive damage is, you send a drone out who can test, which can test sewer lines or, you know, the different, different sort of things that, would, that officials would need to know in order to make recommendations, directives, and sort of things like that to help in the response and recovery process. So I think that getting the message out in terms of what these drones can actually do, um, jurisdictions like uh, the state of Florida and California are using drones to help with accident investigation technology. That would be hugely useful for jurisdictions like those that are struggling to keep manpower in their police departments and they're trying to figure out how do we stretch our resources to the biggest extent while still uh, doing our job effectively. This is a great way to do that. Unfortunately, like Greg mentioned before, you've got the budgetary concerns. There have been some suggestions that perhaps grant programs could work, which would be great. The problem is, as I think Greg mentioned earlier, is that how do you maintain that grant program once the funding ends? And so I think that funding is a huge issue. Um, and that could also be a source of uh, future collaborations for the public and the private sector to kind of come together, notice, noticing how beneficial this technology can be for the public and working together to try to find a financial solution to it. The other side of this, Heather, is that we know that these drones can be used for nefarious reasons, right? And, and it could be uh, as simple as, you know, a peeping Tom situation. Uh, we also know that you know ISIS is currently experimenting with drones. There's been you know, hobbyists who have taken drones and actually hooked up um, automatic weapons and remote fire capabilities. Uh, there there are, are drones available now that could that can carry a, a you know 10 15 pound payload. Um, when you're talking about Bush Stadium in St. Louis, which has an open access uh, port in the in the left field wall, um, it would be. You know, within the scope of reason that somebody would fly uh, either, you know, a weaponized drone into a crowded Cubs-Cardinals weekend series game, mm -hmm. right? So we have an obligation to start having these conversations, to start thinking about what this looks like. We did this paper for our technology class here in the master's program at CHDS, and it was received so well that we actually, uh, we carried over into a, a second edition for our CompGov class and actually looked at what other countries are doing to mitigate and limit some of, some of these issues. And I would love to tell you that somebody has this figured out, and it turns out that they don't. They're wrestling with the same privacy issues. They're wrestling with the same legality issues. I, I read an article within the last two weeks that uh, Japan is, actually has um, counter drones, the same way that you have counter snipers, mm -hmm. where the, the, they are actually flying drones with nets uh, to capture other drones in the sky, like this is this is actually becoming a, a spy versus spy uh, mm -hmm. event that's happening in the airspace above us. 
so it's it's really fascinating, and and uh, you know, as as you know, CHDS has has been doing for the last thirteen years. This is about looking at those emerging challenges and solving not only the issues that we're going to see in our jurisdictions today, but what this looks like five years from now, seven years from now, twelve years from now. These are these are the strategic questions that Homeland Security leaders should be having conversations about. And we would love to say that we think our, our model policy is certainly a start. Mm -hmm. It's certainly a, 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 a touchstone that we think right now is uh, best practice. But these are these are detailed conversations that organizations have to have because it's here and it's mm -hmm. going to keep moving regardless of, of our personal feelings on it. Right. And, and just as the technology is ever evolving, so are the laws and the standards and the regulations that are continually coming out. <clears throat> Articles that it, that are being written in our policy will need to be changed in order to adapt with the ever increasing amounts of commentary that are coming out about that. I think the main thing that we need to remain at the uh, at our focus is the preservation of liberty, and I think that's the biggest concern. That and I don't mean to say that in a in a very general way, but that's the biggest concern that the public has. They want their privacy protected. They don't want their liberty restricted, and so it is a question of how to implement effectively the use of this technology while still preserving what people hold dear. And that has been prevalent throughout the United States and then our work um, in Europe with, uh, with focusing specifically on France and Germany. That has been the feeling over there as well. And people have been trying to figure it out and they've, issued, they've, they've actually um, asked organizations to come out with studies to figure out exactly how to preserve that. So by and large, everyone's trying to figure out how to make this work certainly feels like we're advancing in this time and evolution of humanity towards a more technological, uh, uh, more of the technology replacing the manpower. And we're, we're kind of in the middle of that, right? And you guys did a great job in trying to take a stab at this huge mountain of complexity in trying to make ways for cities and states to, to uh, have that model policy in their in their jurisdiction. So, we really recommend that uh, you read this paper, and if you're in city government, state government, and uh, thank you so much for your research. And thank you for what you've done. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us.